By the way, these two guys, Paul and Yossi, I mean, we really should have a great debt of gratitude for all the schlepping that they do over here for this uh, series and all the others. Thank you. Um, without any further ado, we'll get down to work. Tonight is the last, number six, of this uh, lecture series I'm doing during the three weeks this year, um, in 2022. And as you can see, the title is From Bobel to Barcelona and from Fez to Frankfurt, Powers of Jewish Courts, based in throughout the diaspora. Again, that title was the uh, brainchild of uh, Shmuel Tarshish, who actually is the one who made this happen. Uh, tonight's lecture number six called The Postmodern Era, The Struggles that Have Into to Adjust New Realities, and it's sponsored by my good friends, the Berlins, Herman and Sherry Berlin. There's Sherry over there, in memory of their dear friend, Mrs. Steinhardt, which we, many of us remember. A blessed memory whose third yard site was 27, or 27 Sivan. And uh, I might add that I have in the past that Herman's parents are among the people that founded the show. Right? They were the founders of the show, which would take you back to 1950, I believe. That was uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> okay. Um, and I do want to thank the show for hosting, as we always do. And now we will uh, get down to business. As you see, it's the sixth lecture. And we're going to deal with the modern era and maybe postmodern era. Last time I tried to talk about all the difficulties that happened in the 1800s and the early 1900s, now we carry the story forward. So let's take a look at the 20th century, which is now behind us. <laughs> the 20th century is old history. It's getting older and older. Isn't that make you depressed? Now, um, in 1900, beginning of the 20th century, I think the Basin in, in its classic form looked like a doomed institution. That's a fair uh, appraisal if you looked at it in most of the countries where it had functioned. The only place where the old model continued to function was in the Islamic world, especially in the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Okay? So even when Europe was already modernizing, Turkey was a different story. This is the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And there were lots of Jewish communities here and here and here all over the place. And because it was not Europeanized fully, the Turks Europeanized partially in the 1800s. They had to. Um, but because it still was uh, run on Islamic principles, <clears throat> therefore the Jews had a certain type of autonomy. And the Bayesians in different places had the old-fashioned type of power. Now, I told you before, you couldn't kill somebody or something like that. But there were a lot of legal government-backed powers that a Jewish court could do, including compelling people to you know, keep their stores closed in Shabbos and things of that nature. So um, it had modernized yet and adopted the Western system in which you have complete freedom of the individual from religion. According to Islam, they don't know about that. They still don't know today. Okay? Now, also, in addition, the Turkish Empire was very large, but mention should be made of the next one, which is what you call the colonial system. Um, here is Africa just before the First World War. If you notice, almost the entire continent is ruled by Europeans. About six or seven European countries own 99% of Africa. Okay, So here's your, here's your French stuff. Look at all that. Here's your British stuff here and here and so forth. Uh, here's the Belgian Congo we remember from long ago. Belgium had a territory much larger than Belgium. Germany had colonies. The Italians had colonies. The only place that wasn't colonized was Ethiopia, and that's because the Italian army was so bad that the Ethiopians defeated them. <laughs> that's pretty bad. That's why Mussolini wanted revenge later. So why am I showing you this? Up here, Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, Tunisia, Libya. There's a half a million Jews, Sephardim. Uh, so that's Islamic. But it's modified by what we call colonialism. In other words, as you see over here, over the course of the 1800s, early 1900s, the French, the Italians, and the British took over the whole business. Okay? Now, when they did so, each one of these countries retained the status quo to whatever degree they did. So things will still run in somewhat of an Islamic fashion, and that means the Jewish community had certain internal powers, and the also Bayesians had certain powers, you know, what we call personal status and things like this, in old Morocco, in old Algeria, in old Tunisia, Libya, and so forth. Okay? But the, when you have colonialist rulers, which is not the case of the Turks. The Turks were the bosses in their territory. When you have colonialist rulers, you can play, it creates a complex situation uh, because if they wanted to, they, the European uh, 
the rulers could change the rules. So not many people know this, but Italy conquered Libya in 1912 from Turkey, and Libya has uh, Tripoli, I forget, a couple other places like that, which are famous old Jewish communities. There is such a thing called Libyan Yiddishkeit. And um, the Jews there were still pretty religious. And the Italian rulers said, we want to change the rules. Sunday's the day off, and Saturday's not the day off. And the Jews want to keep their stores closed on Saturday, and they were publicly flogged by Italians, you see? Uh, so I'm just saying, you, people, these are stories from yesteryear. So it's complicated. The base didn't still functions. And if you want to get married within Judaism or divorce, same thing, like you got to go through them. But you could circumvent it by going to the European powers. In other words, to use modern terminology, you could do all this if you wanted to with a justice and a peace and get a civil divorce and that sort of thing. Um, so the colonialist experience is something that's often talked about nowadays <clears throat> that we live in a third world um, culture, United Nations culture, and many of the countries were ruled by colonial powers and still talk about their past oppression and things like that, which I understand. Although to be perfectly honest, if they had their chance, they would have colonized others. <laughs> you know? But nevertheless, the Jews and Jewish institutions were to some degree affected by all this. But that is an exception, what I said. There were probably a million Sephardim altogether, if, um, and I'm using that term widely, from Morocco to Iran, so, something along those lines. So it's not a tiny number, but for that large area, it wasn't such a large population. In Russia, it was six or seven or eight million. You see what I'm saying? So the great majority of the Jews were Ashkenaz in this time. I'll repeat what I told you the other day. There was an unbelievable baby boob between the 1830s and 1930s and the Jewish world population quintupled from 3 million, 3 point something million to about 16 point something million. Mm -hmm. Is this interesting? You see, nobody paid attention to it. If you do the numbers, you'll see. So there was something in the, uh, in the chicken soup. But the bottom line is that there was a tremendous um, uh, population increase. And half the, half the, as you and I know, half the Jews of the world ended up in two countries, the USA and eventually the USSR. That's going to impact on base dense because in the USA, where millions of Jews moved over here, um, there was no interest in having anything like a base dense, even among the Orthodox. You get it? Uh, they adopted, as we know, it still is the case, the, uh, the Protestant synagogue model. So we live in Baltimore. There's no Kehillah, really, in Baltimore, not in any kind of formal sense. There's no real base in, in Baltimore in any kind of formal sense, and they certainly don't have any formal power, and that's the way the American Jews have always liked it. So even when you went back 100 years ago, and all this, when the, all these Jews came from Russia and Poland and who knows where, synagogues they made, cemeteries they made, hospitals they made, to some degree schools they made, basins, not really, okay? I mean, theoretically, there were a few places in America where attempts were made to establish Kehillahs in some form. See, this is so much part of the Jewish ethos and again, we've lost a lot of it today, that when our, not mine, but our predecessors in America around 1900, thereabouts, came over in such large numbers from Eastern Europe, the natural tendency was to try to form voluntarily in this country some kind of a kehillah. You couldn't have it formally, but try to do it informally. And there were attempts, as I think many of you are familiar, to make you the chief rabbi of New York. That was Yaakov Yosef, RJJ. Right? And what was that all about? 10, 15, 20 shoals, I forget, in New York got together of that type. They said, we want to bring over a Rav Harashi, and he'll make a base and all the rest of it. Can't force anybody, but that way they'll bring some order into the Kashras, which was terrible. Hopefully they'll bring some order into Chinuch, which was terrible. You see what I'm saying? The reason you want communities is to hopefully replace chaos with something that makes sense. So it's, it's, it's tricky, okay? But I think everybody's familiar that the RJJ failed. You know what I mean? Uh, in fact, they broke his heart and they put him in the grave. There, there were other attempts in some cities in America, not Baltimore, to uh, have what you might call a vad ha'ir with something along the lines of a chief rabbi. Let's go to the next one. 
So you had Rabbi, uh, what do you call it, in uh, Philadelphia, you know, people like that, and Rabbi Rosenberg, uh, meaning that this is a hundred and some years ago that, um, let's say, immigrants came to a certain place and they ended up setting up four or five shoals. For their own reasons, they said, like I said before, we want to bring some order to Kashras, Taras Mishpacha, Shabbos, Chinuch, things like that. And therefore, we start a Vad Ha'ir, you see? And the Vad Ha'ir will have something like a Vad Kashras of some kind or other, elected by the public and answerable to them. And they'll have a, something common for the cemeteries. And hopefully, they'll have something common for the schools. At that time, they talked about Talmud Torahs, you know, right? Um, and things of that nature. And so, you know, here or there, if you wanted to really scratch, you could find somebody who for a certain while occupied the position of the president of Vadir, St. Louis had, you know, places like that. But it didn't really take over. You didn't really have a base in, in the classic sense. It, it, it kind of didn't work. And anyway, um, in this country, you couldn't. Uh, by the way, who was the number one enemy of setting up base dins in America with power? Not the Reformed Jews and not the secular Jews, the butchers. You understand? You, you understand exactly what I'm talking about, okay? They don't want that. They want to play all the hanky-panky they can and get away with whatever they can get away with. And that's how life was, okay? Remember, strictly speaking, to be a recognized kosher butcher, you have to be keep your clothes, store, clothes on Shabbos. And, you know, a minimum standard of things, let alone the kashras. And we all know, as Bismarck said, the public should not see how the sausages are made. Um, so uh, the early years in America were the uh, kashra scandal years, okay? which cried out for some kind of a basin and solution, but it couldn't happen, not in this country. And when they tried it, this place, that place, the, this guy in the right, the story I've often told, is uh, Convitz, uh, Rabbi Yosef Convitz, who is, uh, by the time he finished, he was, a, let's call him the chief rabbi of Newark. And once upon a time, Newark was big, you know? Um, I mean, if you go back 100 years ago, what were they, 50 shoals? I wouldn't be surprised. And they were serious, so they brought him in as a young man. He was the son-in-law of the, uh, of the Ridvas. He was a big rabbi, let's put it that way. Very good speaker. And uh, he was a big, he was the head of the Mizrahi. He was also head of, our, of the Agodis Rabbonin, went to Slobodka. And he said, we've got to bring some water into the kashas. <clears throat> that means you're rubbing against the mafia, to be blunt. And he didn't care. And they had one meeting after another to try to bring some kind of order into this. And his son uh, was a famous uh, constitutional law professor, Milton Convitz. Maybe you've heard the name. K-O-N-V-I-T-Z. I think he was in some place like Princeton or whatever, but someone gave him one of those types. It, it, back in the day, he was well known as a constitutional law professor, a famous name. And he has a memoir, which you can get online. And I'll say his father was fighting the good fight, supported by the uh, of Abal Abatim, let's put it that way, because people want the kashras to be kosher. And this big Joe Paluca knocks on the door one day, and the convicts opened the door, and he said, big Italian guy, and he said, let me introduce myself. My name is so so my name is Joe Paluca. I work for the mafia. My job is to beat the hell out of people, kill them or maim them or things like that. I was given your name. So I'm a professional. And what I do is I case the joint for a week or two to see your habits, how you walk, back and forth, things like that, where I can get you. I've been watching you for about a week or so. You're a very holy man. I would feel very bad about smashing your face in, which is what I'm supposed to do. So here's what I suggest. Stay in the house. Don't go out for two months. Wrap yourself up like a mummy, and I'll tell everybody I beat you up. You see? And he did it. Because that was America in 1920 or whatever it is. He did it. <laughs> you see? So this is what you're up to. Now, in that kind of environment, go set up a basin and have anything resembling in the slightest degree the powers that we've been dealing with in this course. It's antithetical. Now, um, so anyway, any what they really, as you and I know, needed in America if you want to bring real order into Kostros and a few things like that, you honestly need a national basin, don't you? You see? But that wasn't going to happen. And instead, you just had what they called the period of the Agudas Arabonin, 
in which he had a bunch of rabbis from Europe. Many of them were famous scholars, but um, they were not successful in bringing any kind of order because everybody gave his own extra and, you know, better not to look, as it were. Here's a, that's Calvin Coolidge. Isn't that cool? Oops. Yeah, that's Calvin Coolidge. That's uh, Rabbi uh, Leventhal. Here's the Blazer uh, Silver. Uh, this is Rabbi Rosenberg. The, these are names of yesteryear. The fact that no one's heard of them is my point. Okay? Now, uh, there's exceptions. Once in a while, you could have a successful basin, but only if you're dealing with very religious people. Let's go to the next one. Near Israel was actually started because there was a yeshiva in Cleveland, and Rabbi Rudiman was like number two, and Rabbi Levenberg was number one, and they had fights and this and that and the other, uh, as happens. And they made a basin, of, um, and Rabbi Lizard Silver was the president of the basin, and they hammered out some kind of compromise. Uh, although very, not surprisingly, the compromise wasn't until, as is often the case in these things, the compromise was not really to the liking of either party. And so as you all know, Rabbi Rubin left Cleveland and started his wanderings until he ended up in a place called Baltimore, Maryland. You see? But at least it was a, 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 you're trying, at least let's put it this way, both sides took their, their, their quarrels to a base state. You see? Um, the other big population in the world was in Soviet Union. Well, what's the chances under Stalin? <laughs> There's going to be a base then. You know, forget about it. So, um, but they did, therefore, with a pale shadow of what it had been. There's one exception to this story in the 20th century, and that's what I'm going to devote the rest of tonight to talk about, because that's all I have time for. And that's Eretz Yisrael of Palestine, or be more exact, British Palestine. Okay? Um, may I say that from 30 years, the British ruled Palestine from 1918 to 1948. That is when the foundations of the modern state of Israel came to be. Um, and part of that is based in now, originally, after World War I, this was given to England as the Palestine Mandate, which is equal to Israel plus Jordan. Uh, that's what the British promised would be a Jewish national homeland. But politics intervened, and within a short while, they split this off, and only this was left of Palestine. As you know, this, this was given to, fight, uh, to uh, Abdullah to be his own kingdom called Jordan, which is still around today. Okay. So our story is going to take place in the Israel side, or as you see, Palestine was called from 1922 to 1948. Okay. Now, um, here we have a very unusual situation. It's a, it's a tale for tonight. Before the First World War, Palestine was under the Ottoman, it was Ottoman Turkish. And the Ottoman government, the Turkish government, long before officially recognized the Sephardic basin of the Rishon Lezion as enjoying legal authority in matters of personal status as they did for the Christians too. So in the old Turkish system for hundreds of years, it's a medieval model. If you're a Catholic and you want to get married or divorced or settle a property dispute, go to the Catholic priest or whatever you guys set up. If you're a Protestant, you do it the Protestant way. If you're Jewish, you go to the Jewish thing, what we call basin. Okay? And there was an official base in Yushalayim. There was one in uh, Tiveria, you know, that sort of thing. And they're registered with the government. And they have the power to enforce rules. In other words, if they'll say somebody should be fined because he broke the Jewish religion, the Turkish police will do it. You see, it's like I said the other day, when we talk about the, the powers of base, and it wasn't usually the Jews who administered the physical punishments, but the Jews would issue a verdict, and usually the state would enforce it. In Spain, even to the point of death penalty, as we saw. Okay? So that's what we had. Now, not the Ashkenazi basin. Right? The Ashkenazi were always angry over this. Many Ashkenazi Jews started moving to Palestine, let's say, from the 1770s on. They, didn't get, they weren't allowed to enter Jerusalem officially until like the 1830s because they still owed money in an old debt from 100 years before. Um, and because of various reasons like that, even though the Ashkenazic Jewish community came to outnumber the Sephardic, because more and more Jews, now it's not large numbers, but relatively speaking, more and more Jews in the 1800s made Aliyah from places like Poland, Hungary, uh, Germany, Lithuania, and so forth. Remember, by the 1800s, 
the travel was vastly simplified. You have railroads, you have steam, you know, you have modern boats. So actually, if you think about it, you could actually take a train from Lithuania to Jerusalem. How do you know that? You just go all the way across. Remember, you saw the movie Orient Express. What am I thinking of? Murder on the Orient Express. What is that? It's a train that goes right across Europe down to Istanbul. So you get on the Orient Express, and it takes you however long it takes you. And then you have to cross, you know, the Dardanelles. You know what I mean? Where Istanbul is, you take the ferry boat to the other side, and then you take a train all the way around down to, to Jerusalem. How long does that take? It could take quite a while. I mean, not that long, but I just point out, it's, 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 let's say, two weeks. So he says, it, it, it's, it's uh, vastly different than if you traveled in the 1700s or the 1600s or the 1500s. Vastly different. Okay? By the way, most people didn't do that. They went down to Trieste and took a boat from there. But uh, whatever the case is, the Ashkenaz outnumbered them, but they couldn't get any kind of recognition from the Turks because they don't know what Ashkenaz Jews are. They know Sephardic Jews. That's part of the Middle East. Um, now, don't worry, the Sephardim shot themselves in the foot in the decade before 1914, I don't want to get into too many details, they get involved in such a set of internecine squabbles that they pretty much wrecked their own basin after the old Rishon Lutino died, El Yashar. The big fights who should take his place, and in the best Sephardic style, they know how to have a Donnybrook, and the whole thing kind of fell apart. But we're not getting into that. We're finishing with the First World War. We're starting afterwards in 1918, 1919. So now, Turkish Empire has disappeared. The British are now officially the rulers of Palestine under international law, okay, called the Mandate of Palestine. And in the first five years, the British government at that particular time was, was pro-Jewish, pro not anti-Semitic. This is the famous government of Lord George, okay? Uh, he was the Prime Minister. Balfour was the Foreign Secretary. I think we've heard of Balfour Decoration. Winston Churchill was the big mark in the government. He was also very pro-Jewish. Okay? So the, the British officials in Palestine, a place like that, were pro-Arab and anti semitic But the high guys at the top were pro-Zionist. I'll say it again. Were pro-Zionist. Listen, Balfour is the one who made the, and really Lord George, made the Balfour Declaration in which the British government said if we get Palestine after the war, we will use our powers to create a, a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Right? So uh, it was a heady era. Okay? Moreover, the British government, because they were pro-Jewish, so Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, uh, appointed the first high commissioner, let's say Governor General, a Orthodox Jew. Uh, now, about the fellow, I mean, in other words, he wasn't so observant, but he was an Orthodox Jew. That's Herbert Samuel. Okay, he was a member of the upper, what they call in England, the cousinhood. You know, he's related to all the big mockers and so forth. Uh, but I'll say it again, uh, he, he, he dominated in the United Synagogue. You know, he was an Orthodox Jew. Uh, and they also appointed as the, let's call it the Attorney General, as we say in America, or maybe I should call it the Minister of Justice, the guy in charge of the justice system, a Zionist Jewish lawyer, who at that time was Orthodox, although he was moving to the left, his name is Norman Bentwich. Okay? So Bentwich is a famous British family in the Victorian times. Uh, his father was like the vice president of the United Synagogue and was a Shama Shabbos. Okay? So Norman Bentwich had gone to Oxford. Eh, he was much more you know, to the left. Now, the British certainly had experience in imperialism and running countries. And so by the time they came to Palestine, they say, we got a situation here where we got a bunch of Arabs, got a bunch of Jews, got a lot of different religions. The savvy and experienced British wanted to rule as unobtrusively as possible. As possible. We don't want any riots, if possible. We don't want any revolutions. Just going to control the country. So they wanted the Muslims and the Christians to be happy. There are plenty of Arabs that are Muslims, and there are also plenty of Arabs that were Christians. Okay, plus, you know, all the world churches have churches there and things like that. So how can we, you know, keep everybody happy? And they were happy under British rule, as far as religion is concerned. The British, you know, prided themselves on running a fair system. And so 
there wasn't any persecution of any religious groups in, um, in the years of the British Mandate. There was religious freedom, in other words, although not in the Thomas Jefferson sense, which is foreign to the Middle East. Thomas Jefferson said you have a separation of church and state. They wouldn't even know what that means. R rather, it was the freedom of every single religion to run its own affairs without being dominated by any other religion. See, under the Turkish Empire, the Muslims dominated the others because it's a Muslim state. Right? So you could um, be Jewish, but under the rules of Islam, many centuries they played tough, and you couldn't build a new shul. The Islamic laws if they're, uh, have what you call strict construction, so um, you can only repair an old shul. And it has to be low, building, and so forth. So not under the British anymore. Anybody can do whatever they want. Now, it would now, in other words, be the British Empire that was in charge, and the British prided themselves on being impartial umpires. Just went around the country for the benefit of everybody. It's actually called a mandate. They were given the job because theoretically the locals don't have the chachma to run their own affairs. So the British are going to like nurse them along. That's a theory. Mind you, the British were granting the denominations certain powers, but not all criminal matters were adjudicated by the British secular courts, which the British set up. So they were experienced administrators. So when they took over Palestine in 1919, they set up a civil administration, they started building roads, started collecting taxes, and set up a health department. One of the things they did was set up courts, British courts, running the British law, or sometimes incorporating Turkish law, for criminal matters, you know, things like that. Uh, and anybody could go to these courts whenever they wanted. Okay? Now, um, mind you, the British did not really do themselves a favor by organizing all the Muslims into one unit. You see, for centuries before that, the Muslims were ruled by the Turks from Istanbul. Now it's under a separate country, the British. So the British said to all you Muslims, why don't you organize yourself into one group with like a little pope at the top? And that was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. That was a big mistake. You see? Uh, the bottom line is that under the British, they expect, because they're Europeans, there'll be archbishops or something like that for the various Christian denominations, whatever you call the head of the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox and the Ukrainian Church, the Coptic Church, the Catholics. Catholics is easy. They have a hierarchy already. Each one will have its own little you know, hierarchy to exercise control over their own members, not over others. So I'll give you an example. Whenever we go to Israel now, you walk by the Armenians. The Armenians have their own church. They keep to themselves. Under the British, the Armenian church was recognized as a, as a denomination. They had their head guy, whatever they do over there. And you run your own church affairs. You get it? If somebody feels like you know, going to a British accord, you can do that. But the state recognized the uh, Armenian religious operation, the church. So we're talking about setting up a church. Church means an official, uh, legally recognized, uh, uh, hierarchical institution. Right? Now, you know and I do, the Orthodox Judaism doesn't have that today. Right? Do we have a, a Jewish church? Uh, we do not, right? I belong to this shul, you belong to that shul, and, you know, as the expression goes, I would never step foot in your shul. You know? So, we can do that. Now, again, there will be archbishops and similar types for various Christian denominations to exercise control over their own members and not others. We're not talking about anything other than marriage and divorce and some property issues, but in the issues of marriage and divorce, the denominations would indeed exercise legal courts of power. So if in the Catholic Church, um, let's say, for example, in Catholic teaching, a Catholic guy can marry someone else provided they agree to raise their, the kids in Catholic religion. That's the rule. So suppose you have, that's the rule. The Catholic is allowed to marry a Jew provided that they raise the children in, 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 the, in the Catholic faith. That's the rule. So suppose you had in Palestine, for example, a Catholic guy and a Jewish girl get together and say, we want to get married, but we're going to raise the kids as Jewish or as Hindus. The Catholic priest said, I guess, no, you I can't marry you. You're not allowed to get married. You see what I'm saying? Now, what do they do? So they'll say, well, let's go to the rabbi. The rabbi said, he's a guy. Unless he converts, you can get married. So you're stuck. You see what I'm saying? That's only when they had the power of those kind of things. There's a similar setup for the Muslims. You know, 
if you're two Muslims who want to get together, something like that, you've got to follow their rules. So there should be a similar setup, the British said, for the Jews. The British thought this up. Once we're setting the whole thing up and putting the house in order, so we're doing something for the Christians naturally, we're doing something for the Muslims naturally, that leaves the Jews. The Jews are all hop plop, uh, uh, chaotic, all the rest of it. We want to bring order into the chaos. There should be a similar setup for the Jews, even though this certainly had never existed, and certainly not on a Palestine wide basis. In other words, the British said, we're going to establish something that never existed before a chief rabbinate, chief rabbi, as a legal and official position. It's a government recognized, paid, you know, a, a powerful position. As a matter of public law, this was unprecedented. You never had a, um, a legally recognized uh, chief rabbi of Eretz Yisrael, anything like that. To be perfectly honest, you never had a chief rabbi Ashkenazic anywhere in, in Palestine, right? Um, now, the British immediately said like this, let's get one chief rabbi for the Ashkenaz at the Sephard. You know, after all, what's the difference? That didn't last too long. <laughs> right? They had a little conversation. They said, okay, two chief rabbis. If that's what it is, that's what it is. So far, so good. Now, we run into what you can call Jewish politics and from politics. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go to Jewish politics. The League of Nations, which was the UN at that time, under international law, had granted Palestine to the British to, for the purposes, officially now, to implement the Balfour Declaration. That's what it says in the UN law, okay? The British had given Palestine to implement the Balfour Declaration, which included special legal status for the Zionist organization, or what they call the Jewish agency, the Sachnut. So this is extraordinary. In, in, as a matter of international law, the British, this is the language of the uh, international lawyers. The British were given Palestine, and you're supposed to facilitate, implement the Balfour Declaration, and therefore help the Jews establish a national home, whatever that means. Define the Jews. We're good lawyers here. You know, that's sloppy writing. What's the Jews? The Jews want to do this. The Jews want to, what, what does that mean? So it said, you know, the Zionists were able to put this in. Chaim Weizmann. The Zionist organization is the Jews for the purpose of international law. But we're, we're, we're going to call it the Jewish agency, but it's the Zionist organization, and they represent the Jews. After all, to be perfectly honest, who got the Balfour Declaration? The Zionists. They claimed they're speaking on behalf of the Jewish people. The British gave, in whatever form, Palestine to the Jewish people at the lobbying of the Zionists. So they bought into Balfour and Lord George brought into the idea the Zionists actually represent the Jewish people. Now, the British were not stupid. They knew that there are plenty of Jews in England elsewhere who are, let's say, reform or something like that and disagree from a left-wing perspective. They certainly knew there's what you would call in the Torah Karta types or whatever elsewhere that would reject this from a right-wing perspective. From the British point of view, these were marginal groups, and it's just an interesting story that they ignored them. It's just an interesting story. The bottom line is that when all the laws and everything were passed by the League of Nations and by the British as they were setting up, shall I call it, the constitution of the new mandatory Palestine, so the Zionist organization, which is an official body, is going to be the Jews. Okay? So right off the bat, for the first time in thousands of years, there was a national Jewish political entity, sort of. That's what Herzl and Weizmann were able to pull off. Now, you can say it's a bluff, this and that, call it what you want, but it happened. Okay? Call it what you want, but it happened. So when the British were ruling Palestine for 30 years, and they had any policy that they did, they always consulted with the Jews. The Jews means the Zionist organization, their leaders. Sometimes they agree with them, some didn't agree, but that's what it means, the Jews. Okay? Now, this is extraordinary, but although you and I know, since they got this recognition, the Zionist organization and the Yeshuv, as they called it, the Jewish community in Palestine, had the possibility of being a kihila now because they got the recognition from the others. It could have been a religious kihila, but it defined itself as a secular nationality. Chaim Weizmann, these other guys, said Jewish is a national term. Okay? There are, of course, religious Jews, but they're also not religious Jews. And guess what? The not religious Jew is just as much of a Jew as anybody else, which the halacha does say. 
If your mother's Jewish, you know, you count for a minion. Period. You see? So, um, wait a minute. So if it's a secular nationality, what does it have to do with chief rabbi, which is a religious position? Well, Zionism always said, we're not totally secular. After all, there is one branch of the Zionist movement, and there's one part of the Jewish people who are religious. In other words, we do acknowledge that many Jews out there, not the majority, many Jews out there, define Judaism as a religion. We don't. Chaim White says, I guess, I don't define Judaism as a religion. I don't believe in God. You see? Ben Gurion would say that. I define Judaism as a nationality. But I'm a leader of a yeshuv, which includes many people who do believe in God. Okay? And so the Zionists were always anxious to claim religious Jews as part of their constituency. After all, it was the Lloyd George government and Lloyd George and Balfour and these other guys who issued the Balfour Declaration did all these things for the Jews were not only motivated by political considerations, but they were influenced also by who they were, by um, what I like to call Jerry Falwell considerations. Religious, philo-Semitic kind of um, uh, feelings. Okay? There are plenty of Christians who felt this way about the Jews. They didn't. Okay? So what's Chaim Weizmann going to say? Oh, you're giving me back the land of Israel because King David was there. But I don't really believe that there was such a thing. <laughs> you know, I just wanted as a secular. That would really hurt their, their appeal. Now, um, thus, that's why the Zionists, for example, always tried to claim rights for the Jews at the Kotel, even though it's inconsistent. If you are a secular Jew, it's just a wall. You see? I mean, if, if you got a state tomorrow and it kicked all the Arabs out, would you, Chaim Weizmann, rebuild the base of Mignosh? Why would you? You see? But, but it's a Jewish religious site, therefore it has Jewish national connections, and they submitted it together. Okay? Now, um, what I'm trying to show you is that Israel, Palestine, is religious versus secular. It's not Orthodox versus Reform. You understand? There weren't different definitions of what Jewish religion means. The secular in Palestine, this is very important for our story, we're always willing to say that religion that means Orthodox. It just so happens I don't believe in it. But if I, you know, the, the, if I went to Shul, it would be an Orthodox Shul. Um, that's like an important part of the story. All this is to explain that the Zionists, including the secularists, were interested in the matter of the British setting up a religious hierarchy, the like of which had never existed before. A chief rabbi of a country and not of a shul. What? Now, I'm not talking about a rabbi, chief rabbi, giving drushes, performing pastoral duties. So what is a chief rabbi in the British sense? It's a super av based in. There's a legal position. You're going to set up courts all over Palestine, a court system. The Muslims have one for the Muslim stuff. The Christians have whenever they're Christian communities. And the Jews in Tel Aviv and Haifa and this place and that place and the other will have their rabbinic courts um, recognized by the state. So I'll say again, this was a British initiative because it had to be. The Jews never thought this kind of thing up. And second of all, uh, it's giving them, you might say, power opportunity never existed before. So in other words, uh, the Jewish norms in Palestine in 1920 and in Eastern Europe were such that it wasn't, they're not, you ever talking about rabbis as clergy. You're talking about rabbis as dayonim all paid for by the British out of public taxes. Okay? So the American model of a uh, pastor or something like that, uh, you know, that's not what they mean. Uh, that's not who Ralph Cook was. Now, it happens to be he was a good speaker and he liked to talk and he went around to these kind of things. But the, the legal definition of the job is that you run the court system. Okay? Um, in other words, we're talking about the establishment in mandatory Palestine of a Jewish church um, recognized and supported by the state. An Orthodox Jewish church. Something which had never existed, which to some Frumis seemed Gaish, because it had never existed before. And the atheist Zionists were actually cooperating in the establishment of this Jewish church. So, you know, how do we understand this? That now we're going to have Bate Din with real rabbis, all the rest of it. So, two ways of looking at it. You can be like Rav Cook and say, this is an unprecedented opportunity 
which was true. To have from basins with actual power, recognized and paid for by the government, and therefore in, in, enforcing the laws of the Torah to the degree possible within the modern context. Again, they're not talking about beating anybody up or anything like that, but at least marriage and divorce will be there so the Jews in Israel will be Jewish Jews, as we would say today. And also conversion, I mean that. On the other hand, many people say, yes, Shosh, and So that's the, uh, not the, the Eid HaKaret, it's not the Torah card that didn't exist yet. The Chaim Zonnefeld, who said, this old deal was dreamed up by the British, it's a guys you think you never had that before, we should have the old system, the chaotic old system is the right way to go. Okay, that's what they hear about. Since all of this was brand new, the British naturally wanted to organize everything properly with a law, a statute that would define everything. I mean, that's how you do it in a normal Western country. I repeat, a normal Western country. The Jews never had a country. They certainly were not normal, and they certainly were not Western. Okay? <laughs> but in a regular European country, you know, you, you, you clearly, that's where you bring in your, your judges and your legal scholars and your law students with their, you know, pad and pen, and you draft and you redraft till you get it right. Okay? Now, there's no, there's no question that this was all a big chiddish, quite unprecedented, as I think you see, but what we've talked about in the last of five lectures, right? But so what? So what? Adraba, if you're a cook, you say, it's the beginning of Mashiach, get it? It's the first footsteps, maybe of a long process. The nations of the world are helping us restore the Torah, and so every day we pray, Hashiva Shavtenek Varshana, uh, as in this week's Parsha, this week's Haftorah, Shabbos Chazon, Isaiah, a day will come, a day will come and I will return your judges as of old. Well, well, what's happening? Right? I agree. I never thought it would be Lord Jewish in a Hanami. But, you know, the Lord works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. And it's happening. You see? And, as Isaiah says. And then comes the Mashiach time. Then uh, Jerusalem will be an Eretzedek. So um, it's great. But that's if you feel that Zionism is a plus, a step towards Gula, even though for the moment it's a secular movement. Okay? And so that's Rav Cook. He came, you know, he's the one who says in his Orot, other writings, that the modern movement to revive Palestine. He died before the state happened. He died in 35. But nevertheless, the modern movement in which you see non from Jews coming and on their own wanting to live in Israel and working the land and busting their chops and working on those lousy kibbutzim, you know, with the hot weather and all the rest of it, instead of taking the easy way out and moving to America and becoming a lawyer or something like that and living the life of Riley, uh, it's a racist smichad gula sin. You know what I mean? No, it's a messianic step. And the restoration of the Bezdins is, like I say, the first. Now, he obviously said like this. It's a lot of steps. <laughs> it's not two minutes away. But we're on the yellow brick road. That's the point. And it's better than not being. Okay? Now, of course, Rav Cook was the Zionist candidate. I mean, who else? He was, first of all, he was a gigantic Tom McCall from all the rest of it. But because of his personality and his sympathy with the Zionists, I'll put it this way, Everybody knows all those stories. He would go to the non-religious kibbutzim and would uh, get along with them, praise them. So, on, with, no, not, I mean, and he did that as a, as a real thing, not a fake. So, he was the only, and, and I'll say it again, he was probably the biggest Talmud Chacham uh, around, or uh, without any question, in the top uh, 10. Without question. You know, I mean, in other words, no one challenged that. So, he's certainly a bar hockey to be a chief rabbi and run the basins and all the rest of it. You know, you can agree with the politics. There's no question that he's of the stature. As an old-fashioned Rav, this was great. He saw it. You have Bezdin Mamish. You have a Bezdin. After this institution was falling into desuetude elsewhere and was falling apart because of new conditions, here, thanks to the British, of all people, thanks to Norman Bentwich, you know, they're uh, actually reviving a real Bezdin, nationally organized and funded, nationally followed. The secularists were, were agreeing committed to at least publicly and formally acknowledge the Bayesian and legitimate bearers of legal power. It's unbelievable. So notice you've got guys like Chaim Weitzman and uh, ben and the others who don't believe in anything, and they also, are, for their reasons, are backing this new rabbinate whole system. 
What are the chances of that happening? It's the footsteps of the Mashiach. You get it? You know, to, for that to happen. Now, as a dreamy idealist, Ralph Cook hoped the Palestine system would somehow gain acknowledgement internationally among all the Jewish communities in Chutzlarz. If that happened, I'm sure in the back of his mind, he imagined the full restoration of Basin with coercion and the whole nine yards, like it says in the Torah, righteously applied, of course, no business. So if you go back, what he's, let me put it this way, when he died with Shimon Esrei, Rav Cook, every day, and he came to the part of you tell me what he was thinking about in the 1920s, okay? And again, it's his idealism. Nothing wrong with this. It'd be nice if it happened. That the whole world would say, this is like a Sanhedrin or something like that, and we'll follow the Pesach of the 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 basin of God in Yerushalayim and all that kind of stuff. It, it, you know, it's it's a chief rabbi's dream. The British, which basically meant Herbert Samuel, the Governor General, and uh, Norman Bentwish, they were more down to earth. They wanted a well thought out and well drafted statute. Uh, I think Samuel also, if I remember correctly, went to law school, but Bentwish certainly did, and he was the Minister of Justice in this country called. Department of Justice Attorney General uh, for 10 years in Palestine. Okay? Now, Bentwich, who was a Cambridge educated lawyer, went to the University of Cambridge, wanted the new chief rabbinate, or basin system to be more exact, to resemble the British system, which was, after all, the product of a thousand years of national institutional development sophistication. I mean, we have lawyers in this audience here. The common law of the resident has had many centuries of development, correct? You know, it didn't just hop, hop, hop overnight. And I might even say that the history of English law is a trial and error, you know, over, over the centuries. They evolved this, evolved this, you make your mistakes and you learn. So we British have put together an uh, Anglo-Saxon legal system that works, right? By contrast, as we've seen in this series, the, the Jewish based in was certainly old but never developed beyond the local Kehillah level and without institutional frameworks. In Jewish history, you never had conventions of jurisprudence scholars who met to formulate common norms and frameworks, formal norms and frameworks. <laughs> that didn't exist. The Jewish thing just went on and on and on. And, you know, yeah, they read the Charles and Chubas from each other, but it's a highly informal system. That's why it admitted of many forms, you see? So they, the Jewish legal system did not have the institutional sophistication of the British system, of course, because there's no system, right? There's no system. After all, the British at least have a code of laws. The Jews don't have a code of laws. They have a code of suggestions. They don't have a code of laws. The Ramban, although they don't, they don't have legal formal power, okay? Now, so Norman Bentwish proposed to set up an actual national legal system with Stuff that you and I consider normal when it comes to courts. Written and published verdicts, a full bureaucratic record keeping. So in other words, not like, you know, the basic issue of stock, and uh, they don't tell you what happened and all the rest of it. It's all transparent, which is foreign to the Jewish system. But it is an advantage over the Jewish system. You cannot deny that, right? Certainly in terms of equity. With local rabbinic courts you want to set up, and circuit courts and appeals courts, and a Supreme Court which again is a plus system, because post for whatever happens, this, uh, you know, I know cases and you know cases, the local basin didn't really do such a great job. Well, you want a, a systematic, systemic way of appealing to this within the system. It provides many opportunities, obviously, to overturn the verdicts and rulings of lower, local courts. Now again, not arbitrarily. In America, they don't do it arbitrarily either. You get something overturned an appeal or go to the Supreme Court, you're a pretty good lawyer if you can pull that off. You see? So we've got to make a case. Now, Ralph Cook said, this is all foreign to our tradition. He had him, because he was an old-fashioned Eastern European rabbi, uh, uh, along with everything else. That's not how we do it in Lithuania and Latvia, you know? And Bent would say, look here, it's necessary for equity. You're going to be a public thing. You're not going to be some private business. It's not running a shoal, a shtibel. It's a national court system. So you have to have accountability. You have to have transparency. You have to have a bureaucratic record keeping so people can see what's going on. You understand? So, as we saw, there had been um, 
in different times and places, better basins, more formally organized, less formally organized. There had been here and there, I made mention once or twice in Spain of appeals courts, Dione Salucan as they call it, but it was an uncommon phenomenon. Matter of fact, the book upon which I used and everybody uses to uh, do cor courses like I'm doing with you now is uh, Simcha Asa, Professor Simcha Asa's Ha'on Shin Achar Chasim and another book called Bate Din Achar Chasim They're wonderful. And he wrote this in 1922, 100 years ago, as part of what we're talking about now. He was a friend of Rav Cook, and people were complaining, this is unprecedented. That's right. He said, no, it's not. <laughs> Here you have it. Look at the Shubh Zerajvah. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Look at the Ramo. Yeah, 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 black and white. You see? So this was Kachzich in Palestine among legal thinkers and scholars of all types in the early 1920s. In the end, Norman Bentwich, who had the power, insisted on this funny hybrid system of Bate Din using British norms to some degree. Now again, there are only norms in terms of the systemic situation. We're not telling you how to change the Din. We're talking about having to keep records. <laughs> you know what I'm We're talking about, you know, uh, how to publish verdicts. We're talking about having appeals process. We're not talking about changing the halacha. We leave that up to you guys. And Rav Cook went along. Because the pluses outweighed the minuses. Okay? I mean, this was, and people didn't pay too much attention to it, a remarkable triumph for Orthodox Judaism at a time when Orthodox Judaism was on the down. Um, the British government, which is a real government, is saying that Jewish uh, status will be run not like the Reform and Conservative, do whatever you want, but by Orthodox rabbis within the context of Orthodox law. That's what we are defining as Jewish law. Uh, that's quite extraordinary, all right, in the 1920s. Mind you, now, there weren't any Reformed Jews in Palestine, and the ones they had in America were mostly anti Zionists, so I said they didn't care. Mind you, the secular Zionists set up their own set network of secular courts. Because why would they want to go to a basin? They call it a Beit Mishpat. So in case you don't know, anybody's Israeli knows this, this is where you have two places, a Beit Din and a Beit Mishpat. One is a religious court, one's a secular court. See, that's how they do it. Din, Mishpat, you know. Um, and, may I say, you therefore had um, three court systems in mandatory Palestine if you're Jewish. I can go to a basin. Alternatively, I can go to a Beit Mishpat. Alternatively, I can go to a British court. Right? I mean, all those, let's say the two litigants say we want the jurisdiction of the British court, you can do it. If the two litigants say we want to go to a rabbinic court, you can do that too. If the two litigants say you want to go to a Beit Mishpat, you can do that too. You see? That was the system that they had that was set up. Um, so hold that thought. And now let us turn from Jewish politics to from politics, or at least the Rashi Prokham. I think you understand that in something like this tonight, I can't do six hours on all the Lush and heart. We have to just give you the briefest references so you'll understand that I'm skipping over a lot. Um, under the Turks, as I told you for a long time, the Ashkenazim did not have any recogni recognized courts. The Bati Din had no legal power, which had large ramifications let's say in property matters or things like that. If two litigants went, and let's say Rabbi Shmuel Salanter was a famous guy, Paskin, that this guy gets the money, if the guy doesn't want to listen, he had no power to enforce it. You see? And so he would probably have to go to the Sephardi court and say, you know, back me up or something like that. If they chose to do it. You see? So um, that's what it was. Now under the British, this is going to change. As I just told you. But specifically... Which Beisdin, or Bati Din, would the British recognize and empower? Okay? Indeed, which Haredi court would they empower? Because there were more than one. There were all those different Kolin. The Frum community, the Haredi community in Jerusalem has always been radically divided since I don't know when. And you used to have been 1800 with the gold of Kolel. You get your money from Kolel, Russia. He gets his money from Kolel, Hungary. This one gets his from Kolo Hode from Holland. They even had something called Kolo America, believe it or not. And they had something, uh, Kolo Ukraine. So each one guarded its own little bailiwick. Each one had its own little courts, or one recognized the other. You just imagine the crazy internal politics, Haredi internal politics 
um, you know, in those days. This is where the personality of Rav Cook plays a role. Rav Cook started out, he was born in Latvia. He went to Voloshan Yeshiva. He was a rabbi in Lithuania for a while. Um, eventually, he moved to Palestine because his father-in-law was the Punabi Sharov, the Adaris. That time, the Punabi Sharov. And um, uh, uh, Adaris, a rabbin was to him. And the chief rabbi of the Ashkenazim Yishalayim, Shlomo Salanta, was an old man. And they said, let's bring him in so that when he leaves the scene, he'll take over. But as often happens in the history of the Catholic Church, the old guy lived one and one and one, and the young guy died. So that's what happened. Uh, but since they moved to Palestine, so the father-in-law said to Rav Kook, come and join us in Palestine. And Rav Kook was a very spiritual type guy. At the time I'm talking about, he was not a Zionist at all. He became the rabbi of Yafo. Yafo, Bahamo Shavot. So, you know, at that time they were starting to set up, there was Rothschild type settlements, Zichron Yaakov, Benjamin, and all that business. And so, broadly speaking, Rav Kook is like, so to speak, the official rabbi. No, there's no official rabbi. See, that's my point. The Turkish government doesn't recognize any Ashkenazic rabbi. But the, but the Ashkenazim, you know, recognize him. But obviously, the non former are not going to, you know, roll over what he says. But this is the personality of Rav Kook that he was able, by the force of his personality, to win over a lot of people, you know, that way. Okay? What's the expression? More with sugar than with vinegar. And that's who he was. So he had a lot of fans. And may I say that from 1905 or thereabouts until the First World War, the Haredim had no trouble with him. Okay, they said, on the contrary, you need a rabbi there for Yafo. It's not Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is like this. Over there, you need, he certainly was an old-fashioned rabbi, but everybody was a little more broad-minded. That's a perfect schnitt. You get it? You know, like you said, like this. This guy would not be a good rabbi, a chveis, and rabbi burger shul. But this shul, it, it would fit very good. You know what I'm saying? Like that. And so, even though Rav Kook is famous for supporting the Hatter Mechira, plenty of Haredim were also in favor of the Hatter Mechira once upon a time. Okay? So, no one had a problem with that. Then came the First World War, which he was away from Palestine. He was in England most of the time. When the war was over, and he came back, 1919, his fans, he had a lot of Hasidim, because people were admiring of him, because he had an admirable personality. Now, as you could hear, people would be fans of his. They wanted to elect him chief rabbi of Yerushalayim. That's when the first started to fly. Now, his idea was like this. My father-in-law was supposed to be chief rabbi. Anyway, he died young. During the war, there was no chief rabbi. And, and Rove of the Tzibor wants to elect me. But the mute of the Tzibor was what we call today the Hungarians and the others, and they said, no, this is part of the dirty politics of yesteryear. And so they broke away. So there was an election. And he was elected by Rove of the Tzibor. I want to be clear about this. He was elected by the, what we would call today the uh, religious Zionists and also by the Haredim. It's important to understand that. He had a majority of the Haredim there, what, we, what you and I would call the Litvisha. Let's put it that way. Okay? Uh, but there were other Haredim that rejected him. Right? And they, these other Haredim said, oh, you're electing him, we don't recognize it. They set up something called the Eda Haredis. It was hoped for that's the Badas, right? Teda Haredis, which is Eidoha Haredi, the Haredi Kehillah, which is his name indicates was a separate Kehillah. It's like the Austrian Kehillahs in Central Europe. So Rechaim Zonifel was Hungarian, and so were a lot of these other guys. Now, there were Litvish among them also. It's a, it's a, it's, like I say, it's a lot of Loshahar. But suffice it to say, they were taking the attitude, which is a pretty strong attitude. Samson and Rachel Hirsch broke away from the community because they're run by reform. You see, in Hungary, they said they're going against the reform. This is not exactly what you call reform. To them, it was. He said, but how can you say anything like that? You don't ask no questions. We're talking about your shalom. You don't ask no questions. So they set up like a, a separate kill. And so now you had two separate parallel Orthodox kills in Jerusalem. The Eid Haredis obviously set up its own base in, which claimed, of course, to be the sole genuine court. Because the whole theory is like Hirsch. We are the real Jewish community. The other one's a joke. So that's what these guys are saying. 
We have real tequila, and our basin is the real basin. And to be perfectly honest, Chaim Zonifel was also world class. You know, no one challenged that. And so, um, you have a, uh, an interesting situation. Now, I'm going to um, skip a lot of details, and I'm going to skip an ocean of juicy lush and heart, because, first of all, there's no time, and second of all, we are during the nine days. <laughs> okay? Suffice it to say that the British government recognized Ralph Cook in his courts, and they refused and declined to recognize Data Harris in its court. I mean, they said it in a public document. Look, at this is amazing. This is issued by the British administration. Uh, the following public notice appeared in the Palestine Gazette, April 1921. Uh, pa Gazette, I don't know if you know this, in America also, when the law is passed, it has to be like officially published in some publication. I forget what it's called. Um, some lawyer will tell me. It has to be officially published in a government thing, and then only that moment does it become actual law. So um, the rabbinical assembly held in Jerusalem on February 24, 21, Adarishan this, elected the following rabbis, this is the British talking, as the rabbinical council for Palestine. Rabbi Yaakov Meir, that's the Sephardi, Rabbi Isaac Cook, that's, as chief rabbis, and Rabbi Alkosar, Kanenka, and these other guys, as Sephardic members, Tzvi Pesach Frank, Yonaram Fisher Bursa Ashkenazi members, Dr. Eliash, who was a Shem Shabbos, and these, in fact, all these guys are Shem Shabbos, were lay council of the rabbinic council. The government of Palestine will recognize the council and any based in, they say that, <laughs> right? The government council will recognize the council and any based in, sanct sanctioned by it, meaning by Ralph Cook and all that, as the sole authorities in matters of Jewish law. It will execute through the civil courts judgments given by the base in the council in the first instance, or an appeal as well as judgments given by base in Palestine sanctioned by the council. So basically, if they award the property to you and you won't give it up, the government of Palestine will kick you out of the house. Well, no, they'll use the police thing, which is what a government does to courts. Agree? Maybe not in Baltimore, Maryland, but it's, it's supposed to be the court issues a, a ruling, and then the government is supposed to enforce it. Now, look what they're going to say. The appointment of Chacham Bashi no longer exists in Palestine, so the old Turkish system is gone. We're abolishing it, and no person is recognized by the government as chief rabbi except the rabbis uh, uh, elected by the assembly. So notice, we're not interested in Ada Haredes. You get it? Signed, the chief secretary, and so forth and so on. So in other words, the British government said, we recognize, officially anyway, one based in, and that's the national court system. National court system with branch courts. One in Haifa, one in Tel Aviv, one in Tiferi, and so on and so forth, all over the place. That'll be set up by Ralph Koch for the Ashkenazim and Yaakov Meir for the Sephardim. And that's what the British government is going to acknowledge as a based in. And from then on, if you want to get married, divorce, or anything like that, you have to go through the basin. Even the people in the most secular kibbutzim, they just had to get used to it, which is why there's a well-known scene. Let's go to the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. The, yeah, excuse me, yeah. By the time a Rav Cook system was identified, by this time the Rav Cook system was identified with the Mizrahi, with the religious Zionists. The Eda Haredes was identified with the Agoda. That's the way the European politics play out in Europe. The Mizrahi said, we, we adopt and support Rav Cook. These guys said, we adopt and support Zonnefeld. So the whole subject of Jewish courts, all of whom were staffed by very firm Rabbanim. <laughs> Let me clear this. You know, I'll say it again. We're not dealing with Samson Rebbe Lahersh over here. <laughs> you know, it's this, let me put it this way. Maybe you've heard of two base of Frank. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Who was in the Mizrach? He was in Ralph Cook's base there. Okay. They became a political football because the Aguda in the 1920s and 30s lobbied continually and unsuccessfully year after year to obtain legal recognition. This was the heart of a good of politics in the 20s and 30s, um, if you follow those sorts of things. And they were always having a meetings with British officials and the League of Nations officials in Zurich and talking in London and so forth to try to get them to say that, you know, really the Zionists do not represent the Jewish people and they certainly don't represent us. And we, uh, you know, fairness and equity means the British should recognize us too, but it never happened, okay? So from 1920 
1948, all cases of marriage and divorce and conversion, from or not, were handled by the Rav Cook courts. No wedding counted if it was not performed by a rabbi. In other words, there did not exist justice and peace. And not just any rabbi had to be a rabbi licensed by the Rav Cook courts. So it's not even like America. America, you can pick any rabbi you want in the state of Maryland. Just have to sign the necessary licenses. You see? In fact, don't have to be a rabbi. I could declare myself my own church. You know, some people do that. I'm the church of uh, Looney, Looney Tunes. <laughs> What's your problem? You see, what What's your problem? Right? And as long as I am, the state of Maryland won't give me any trouble. So, um, this was the monopoly of the Cook Basins, or what we call the Rabbanut, which means the system of courts. And uh, even the secular had to get married that way. First it was Ralph Cook, and then was his successor was Ralph Herzog. Both of them were gigantic authorities. There was no question in the world that they had the scholarship and the character. You know, no, no one could, could question that. And so the result was that these, uh, of all places in Palestine, there it's Israel, Basin is alive and kicking in a way that's not true elsewhere. It's funny. And it was under secular and British auspices that this happened. So much so that if you go to the next one, there's a famous novel by Arthur Kessler called Thieves in the Night, a very famous novel about life in Palestine. And he, he's a super atheist, but he's got a whole scene over there. I remember I read it a million years ago where the, the kibbutz guy who's super nothing has to bring a rabbi in from somewhere and to perform the wedding and all the rest of it. And this is why the kibbutzim and the others have kind of gotten used to it. And uh, it, hasn't really, it hasn't been a real push uh, in Israel, remarkably, even today in 2022, which is 75 years later, to change the system. You know, every once in a while, you have some people change the system. But uh, usually it's coming from Americans, right? if you follow that sort of thing. The Israelis, like, they're used to it. You know, that, my mother got married by a rabbi, the great-grandmother, and this one got divorced over here, and they just, just became part of, the, part of the furniture. So it's quite interesting. By the way, there were Karaites in Israel, and they had their own system with their own chief rabbi, whatever you call it, and their own Bayesian. And the other Jews said, fine, no problem. No problem. That's a different religion, no problem. To sum up, because of various political considerations, the Ottoman system of Sephardic courts sanctioned by the state was applied by the British to Ashkenazim for the first time. The unique charisma of Rav Kook lent legitimacy to the whole thing because it would have been like some mediocrity when the work. And the vast knowledge of Rav Herzog after him continued it. I'll tell you right now, you know, subsequent chief rabbis in Israel, not in that league. Um, and, you know, with exceptions, of course. And uh, when they had the power. These two guys were in there from 1920, almost 1960, almost. So it's close to 40 years. They laid the foundation for this sort of thing. Okay? Now, here comes the funny part. Then comes 1947, 48, and 49. Ben-Gurion and the Zionist leadership uh, promised to maintain the status quo. And we forget that until May 14th, 1948, it was touch and go. Truman was backing down, if you remember the story. The British were backing down. The United Nations was reconsidered. You know, it was a touch and go. And they used to have United Nations commissions come and investigate. And so what the Zionists really didn't want was that the Haredim should say like this, this is all trade, it's not Jewish, we have nothing to do with it, and so on and so forth. So they basically said, you know, don't rock the boat. And the Haredim and the others, they basically, they said like this, um, if you promise not to change the status quo, we won't rock the boat. So even when Israel become a state, we should continue this system. Even though it was associated with the British and all the rest of it. And Ben-Gurion, these guys said yes. Now, in the same way, the Haredi courts got no recognition. So the system still is today. You get what I'm saying? In other words, the Rabbanut courts, which are there, are under the state system. They don't recognize the Eid Haredis and all this kind of stuff. Now, but, they, but, the, but, but the Israeli government and the police power will enforce the rulings of the Rabbanut courts. This one is clear. So basically, the state of Israel was promising to maintain and fund out of taxes the rabbinic court system, which of course raises the question, why did Ben-Gurion do it? Well, Ben-Gurion's best friend, even though they quarreled right and left, was Rabbi Maimon, the head of the Mizrahi, right? They always got along. 
but I, actually, they didn't get along, but they liked each other anyway. And basically, he said like this, you know, uh, you got to keep this uh, court system in there. You see? Don't rock the boat. And so, uh, then came the elections uh, for the Knesset for the first time in early 49, after the War of Independence. And I've told this story many times, but um, if you know the results of the Knesset, as you know, it's, it's, a, it's 120 seats, 120. So the magic number is 61. Agreed? As we follow politics even today. You know, Israel does not have a constitution, has no checks and balances system. So if you control 61 seats, it's like in a business corporation. If I control 51%, I'm the boss. So the magic number is to get 61. The problem is the arithmetic current not bad. Because in the first election, the Mapai party, which was Ben Gurion's party, got 45. That's 16 short. Um, after my part was the Mapam party, which was like the ultra left kibbutzim beyond Ben Gurion, they got 19. So theoretically, 45 and 19 would give you over 61. Uh, but the problem is Ben Gurion wanted to have a domestic socialist policy. So in that, he agreed with the Mapam, but the Mapam was pro Soviet. They thought Stalin was like Swiss cheese. Um, they loved Stalin. And Ben-Gurion hated Stalin, and he was a Cold Warrior. He wanted to line up with America in the Cold War. That's what he did, right? Right or wrong, but that's what he did. Um, so you can't go with the Mapan. But then what do you do? Well, let's put it this way. You have 14 seats for Menachem Begin. God forbid. There's no way Ben-Gurion would ever get in the government with Menachem Begin. <laughs> you know? That was not going to happen. So then what do you got? You see where I'm going? The General Zionist Party had seven seats. It's not enough. Then you have the 16 seats of the religious parties. At that time, they were combined in what they called Chazit Tatit. In one block, a religious party, Yagod and Mizrahi, as you and I would call today. The regular Mizrahi and the Polo Mizrahi. The regular Yagod and the Polo Yagod. All together, at 16 seats. 45 and 16 gives me 61. It's a magic number. Now, are the religious parties going to care whether he has a domestic socialist policy or domestic capitalist policy? Are the religious parties going to give him any grief because he has a pro-American foreign policy or a pro-Russian foreign policy? They don't care about anything. They just want what they want. They want money for their institutions. You see? And that's the deal they've been growing cut because they give him maximum freedom. With the religious parties in this coalition, they can pretty much do whatever you want in large areas of policy economics and in foreign policy, the security policy, because they backed whatever he wanted, as long as he paid the price. The price was to support the religious institutions, and if it's the Mizrahi party, it's to support the Rabbanut Rashid, which means the court system. So for Ben Gurion was in power for 15 years, and, for, and after he left, there was another 15 years, and then Begin came in. That means the first 29 years of Israel we had the system that I just described, which was always the Mapai party in one form or another, plus the religious parties, or at least the Mizrahi party. They used to get 12. So um, they were willing to pay that price. So as a matter of electoral politics, as much as anything else, we had a system where under the secularist, Mapai, socialist, <laughs> irreligious parties, you couldn't get married or divorced without going through a rabbi. And you couldn't even get converted unless the conversion was recognized by an Orthodox rabbi. Now, in a secular state, you have religious coercion, which is an anomaly down till today. There, to my knowledge, there's no other secular state like this. You understand? Plus, if you're reformer, conservative, you give them a big boot. You understand? Because so it's very insulting. Correct? Well, let me put it this way. State of Israel is not going to recognize a reform conversion. See, whether or not they recognize a reform marriage has to do with halakhic considerations. And the reform don't have a, a, a divorce. The conservative has a divorce. That's always been a tricky question. But Derek Klaw, that's a, that's a tricky question. But with Derek Klaw, they didn't recognize a conservative divorce. When it comes to conversions, forget about it. You see? Now, to tell you the truth, that's a powerful tool. Because Israel has what we call the Chok Hashvut, the law of return. So anybody who's defined as Jewish automatically has a right 
as we all know, to show up in Israel and say, I'm here. Right? Now, the government, unless they have a strong reason not to, makes you an instant citizen. These are coercive powers. If I'm a Bayesian system, and I say, you're Jewish, and you're not, you see? I'll give you an example. Suppose somebody showed up, the long beard and all the rest of it, and the Bayesian basically found out like this. Your great-grandmother's conversion was, was no good. Well, guess what, buddy? Hit the road. <laughs> you see? They can do that. Now, um, these are courts of powers. What's remarkable is the broad public, which is not religious at all, always mumbles and grumbles about it and borches and schmorches, but they never changed it. This is interesting. They never changed it. Every once in a while, there's a crisis. So the main crises were over conversion. And every once in a while, there was some case that the newspapers blew up. There was a lady, uh, uh, I forget exactly, that her husband was a naval officer and she was Scottish. And then, you know, they, and he wanted, and he and Badafka said, I don't want to believe in religion, so I want to get recognized as Jewish otherwise. And the government did so, and the Mizrahi quit the government. It was a whole crisis. And Ben-Gurion wrote a, a public letter to like 50 scholars around the world, obviously Jewish leaders. What exactly is the Jewish position? But I can tell you, 40 out of the 50 were like religious in some sense, and on the 40 out of 50 said, I guess, follow the chief remnant of Jerusalem. You understand? Know I mean, he had a couple of reform guys all there. Freehoff was there, and a few others. But anyway, it's true. But Rove de Ruba de Ruba, they said, you know, you follow the chief rabbi. So, um, and may I say, the system could not have worked unless there was a safety valve. And there always has been a safety valve, which is you can fly to Cyprus, which takes an hour. The plane from Israel to Cyprus, you get married in a, ceremony, in a civil ceremony in Cyprus, and Israel will recognize that. What do I mean when Israel will recognize that? For purposes of property and taxes and things like that. And that's what you really care about if you're a Chiloni. You understand? So any Israeli didn't like the system, when they, they, they went to Cyprus. Right? And the Rabbanut is smart enough to say, don't tamper with that, you know, uh, what's the right word, safety valve or something like that. You have to let them steam out. Yeah, I'll repeat again. The whole system is very delegitimating of reform and conservative. Until recently, they never made a big stink out of it. Now they do. Now, in my personal opinion, I think deep down, the reason from Ben Gurion down until today, that they felt comfortable leaving this in Orthodox hands, and they didn't want to leave it in Reform hands, is if you say you recognize any conversion, what's to stop some left wing Reform rabbi from nowhere who hates Israel immediately say like this I hereby officially convert all the Palestinians. Now they have the right to come in and take over. You get it? Like, you know, you have no control over that. You see? If you think about it, this way, I'm sure that was in Ben Gurion's mind. Never talk about it. If you land hands around, but that ain't happening. You see? He like it that way. Because you're putting a gun in the hand of a lunatic, as the expression goes. You gotta really watch what you talk about. Because otherwise you say like this. If you recognize any conversion form by any Jewish clergyman, oh my God. You see? Now, I don't know that, but I suspect that. Um, and so, as a result, by the way, in the 21st century, I'm talking tonight about the 20th century, the reform and conservative are more assertive. I don't blame them from their perspective. I don't blame them. On the other hand, the more so Bezin got a Trias Amesim in the modern state of Israel. Who would have thought? The Haredim have evolved a very complicated uh, relation with the Bezin. Um, on the one hand, ew, it's Zionist. It's novel. Not so novel anymore, but was. Uh, it's Gaish. On the other hand, do you know who's been on the rabbinic courts? Uh, a lot of what you call big heavy, Rabbi El Yashiv, as you know, and uh, Tzitz Eliezer, and uh, Rabbi Pesach Frank, and Rabbi Yosef. I'm just saying, you have some heavy hitters over there. So you can't just simply uh, 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 like that. Now, that doesn't stop some from doing that. But nevertheless, the Dayanim, generally the courts of Israel, are pretty knowledgeable guys. It's not a sinecure you know, just get, you know, because you know somebody. There is that element in it. There always is in Israel. You know what they say in Israel? If you know the right people, you do not need protexia. You understand? So 
There is that element, but nevertheless, I'll say it again, that's a question of two equally qualified candidates who gets it. But you can't be you know, a junior guy. I'll tell you the truth, they recently uh, said, I saw an Israeli paper, they said, you know, the new Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Israel, they don't use these words, Rabbi Lau's son. He's okay, but he ain't no heavy hitter. Right? And so they say, you know, we should now pass a law divorcing the position of chief rabbi from serving on the court. Chief rabbi is a public position, it's a ceremonial, all the rest of it, and you don't have time necessary to totally throw yourself in the court. The people who are in the Dayanim eat and breathe this stuff 24-7, and you have to be holding and learning, as they say, totally, totally, it's full time. So why don't you just take a little break, <laughs> you know? Um, which is very insulting. You know, they went to Dunder of Herzog or whatever. But that's the nature of the beast. It calls for a high level of expertise. Um, so you can't just machavek. I'll tell you something interesting. Until very recently, there were no Hasidic judges. Isn't that interesting? It was like a litvish, you know, uh, uh, monopoly. Um, now, on the other hand, the Haredi world, the litvish and the Hasidic, follow their own leaders. Yeah, they have no formal allegiance to the court system in Israel. This is due to its own story, the remarkable story of the Haredi revival since 1945 in the context of the yeshivas and the Hasidic groups. I mean, Bezdin is not really a central institution in the Haredi world. Isn't that an interesting observation? It's a charismatic world of a different sort. Right? Who do you really listen to? You understand? Um, Gedolim, not institutions. You see? A ger chassid will go to a ger bezdim because the ger rabbi told him to. <laughs> you understand? That's the reason. A litvish guy will go to a bezdim, Karelis, or whatever, because that's what his Rosh Hashim will do. So you ask him, so it's a different power structure. In other words, this is contemporary sociology. They've emerged um, to replace the institutional authority uh, um, uh, centers, uh, charismatic authority centers. That's what dominates the Haredi world. Anyway, as you see, this topic can go on and on. As I said, we can only scratch the surface in this lecture series. Nevertheless, the remarkable fact is that thanks to British policy and Israeli politics, Bayesian as a real institution with coercive powers has experienced an unexpected revival in literally the last 100 years. Because the story I told you took place in 1922, and here we are in 2022. Okay? In the largest and most important Jewish community in the world, where they preside over a population, the majority of whom are not religious. What are the chances about that? This is an extraordinary story I told you tonight. Now, Bayesian cannot physically harm anyone, but they can financially sanction and the truth is they can imprison a guy who's a bad husband. In other words, if he won't give his wife a get, they can throw you into jail. Unfortunately, some of these guys are so stubborn, even in jail they cause you, but still, usually it works, okay? And they do sometimes. The problem of the aguna and the, again, the bad husband and his, and his victim is still unsolved. The Bayesian system was not able to solve it as we saw in the Gaonic times, in the Middle Ages, and even now in the state of Israel, with all these power, they haven't solved it. Although if there's any court system that can take this seriously, it would be the rabbinic court system in Israel. Okay? Um, because in the 21st century, because it is the 21st century, not the 20th, so the newest, most interesting uh, aspect of the development of Asian is women. Now you have, I was saying that starting in the 21st century, uh, women who are participating in Basin as Toa Note which is a very interesting phenomenon. So you have to be pretty learned. And they have some of these. Now, I'm talking about from ladies, which is a function of there being an actual basin which interact with the broad public right and left, from and not from. You understand what I'm saying? If you service and have to deal with a large public, you can't take a right-wing position, necessarily, because the public won't go for it. This is the Jewish history. It's pre Haredi. You understand? The Jewish communities in the old days before the rise of Reform and Elder Israel had to deal with the whole community, the, the Hasidim and the Poshim. Right? So I'm not saying this is exactly the same thing as the Poshim, but nevertheless, if you're in Israel and you're in a rabbinic court, you can't say like this, you know, we will not 
allow this and this to happen until, until you keep shop. So, it doesn't happen. You see? Uh, it runs into problems when they want to have conversion, like with the Russian Jews, all the others. Formally and technically, you could say, like, we're only going to convert you, you know, if you totally become from and all the rest of it, mm-hmm. and you cover your hair and so forth. Forget about it. You see? So it's just very interesting how these things go, but that's a function of being an actual living basin. That's a function of dealing with real life. The Haredim don't have to worry about that because the Haredim, by definition, only deal with their own. If you don't listen, then you're no longer a Haredi. You understand? So, so it was a Haredi basin, they could definitely say, you know, we're not going to convert you unless, you know, your kids wear a shrine or kapot or something like that. They can do whatever they want. It's their own community. I leave on that note, a historical basin, as I just said, always had to deal with everybody in the community from and from. That is how real halacha developed, frankly. That sounds like maybe a topic for next year, but for tonight I wish you good night. And so we close with Lashon HaBab Yishalayim. Yeah, Mamar would be in the other room for those